The Nonprofit Podcast, powered by DonorBox. Savvy nonprofit leaders, founders, and fundraisers are always looking to unlock the secrets of successful fundraising. Welcome to the Nonprofit Podcast. I'm Kara, fundraising coach at DonorBox. We're here each week with practical actions you can use today to increase donations and take your nonprofit to the next level tomorrow. I know I just mentioned trying to find the secrets of successful fundraising. Well, they're not really so secret. Successful fundraisers provide options for giving that work best for their donors. If a donor wants to give by mail, make that possible. If they want to give online, make it really user-friendly and secure. It's important to offer multiple payment options to provide supporters with the convenience they're looking for. Today, I'm joined by Alex Wilson, the co-founder of The Giving Block, to talk about giving donors some more giving options and convenience. Welcome, Alex. Hey, Kara. Thanks for having me today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, I think that we are both seeing that more and more nonprofits are offering donors ways to give outside of traditional methods like checks and cash, or I'd even say online giving is a traditional method anymore. And savvy donors want to donate by making non-cash gifts like stock or cryptocurrency. And savvy nonprofits have systems in place to accept these gifts, right? Yeah, exactly. It's it's certainly only becoming more common to accept non-cash donation methods. You know, DonorBox has recently partnered with the Giving Block to help nonprofits of all size um, and all abilities accept non-cash assets as easily as credit card or an, an online donation directly through their DonorBox platform. And this integration allows donors to choose non-cash options alongside those traditional payment methods when they make their contributions. And I think this is going to be a game changer for many organizations. Yeah. What, what are some reasons why donors choose to give stock or crypto compared to those traditional methods? So I think the number one thing to understand around this is simply that the majority of the world's wealth is stored in non-cash assets. Over 90% of wealth is stored in things like stocks and crypto. Um, People aren't just sitting on piles of cash. Mm -mm. And it's often much easier, especially for for wealthier donors, to give stocks, crypto, other types of non-cash assets rather than make a huge credit card gift right, or a huge cash gift by writing a check or or sending a wire. So this is the preferred way to give, especially for large gifts. And the other piece that coincides with non-cash giving is also the tax benefits. Mm -hmm. So that can be a huge driver as well. So not only are there, there, you know, kind of dollars in essence stored in these non-cash assets, but there's actually a tax benefit too, because if they donate, let's say stock or crypto that's gone up over the last couple of years, they don't have to pay capital gains tax um, when they donate that asset to a 501c3, right? So if they were to sell that asset, then pay the tax and then make a cash gift, they're going to be losing 20 or 30% mm-hmm. of that value. So it's the nonprofit getting more money and the donor getting a higher tax deduction. So it's really a win for both sides. Yeah, that really is a win. And it's a smart way to support some causes that you care about and you get some tax savings too, which yeah, that makes a positive impact and it, you, it allows you and the nonprofit to keep more of your hard-earned money, which is really great. Yeah, exactly. So I know nonprofits sometimes struggle with trying to understand these non-cash contributions. They don't come intuitively sometimes, the understanding of that. I think a lot of nonprofits find it tricky to add being able to accept these non-cash gifts to their overall fundraising strategy. And probably not because they don't want to, but it They just might not have all the know-how and resources yet. So what can nonprofit leaders find the most challenging when it comes to accepting non-cash contributions? I'd say there's kind of two primary factors to, let's say, hesitation, right? Mm -hmm. Um, One thing we hear a lot from nonprofits when we're speaking to them about crypto and stock and and non-cash giving is they say, well, no, I'd love to, but, you know, I don't think it's really for us doesn't really match our donor base. I don't think we have donors who have those things. And this is one of the most common misconceptions because we're like, well, if you're not on the menu, right? If you don't have these options of giving, you're never going to know, right? Very few donors are probably going to reach out to you and say, hey, I wish you took crypto donations. They're just going to the next nonprofit they like that does take crypto or stock. 
Mm-hmm. So I'd say that's a, a big misconception we come across a lot. And then the secondary piece of that, I think, is more what you're alluding to is like from an operational perspective and how they implement this. Um, I think people, especially with crypto, probably more than stocks, hear crypto and think, ooh, really technical, really complicated. I'm not sure how that works. Um, And it's funny because we always say like, you don't need to really know the nitty gritty of how the technology works, right? Like I barely know how my laptop and the internet work, right? (laughs) But I still use it every day to get my work done. Exactly. So yeah. That's like focus on the benefit for, for your organization, your community, your mission, your donors, rather than getting too hung up in the technical weeds, because there are platforms like DonorBox out there that are making this just as easy as getting any other online gift. And the mission of the giving block really was to simplify non-cash giving. We saw too many nonprofits creating complicated and, and overly complex solutions for accepting stocks and cryptos when they don't need to reinvent the wheel each time. I think they underestimate how many great solutions there are to be able to seamlessly take crypto stock and other non-cash gifts. And then as the money flows through, you know, they still end up with U.S. dollars in their bank account, just like they would for any other gift. Do you have an example of an organization that saw some major benefits when it started to accept these non-cash contributions? Yeah, um, there's there's quite a few. We have some great case studies and testimonials we've written out on our website too. But, but one of our sort of... Uh, star clients is actually Save the Children. They were actually one of the first large nonprofits or global nonprofits to accept Bitcoin. I think it was back in 2014 already, before it even existed. Yeah. Um, And what's unique about them is they were actually accepting crypto before they were working with us, but they didn't have a great way of accepting it. It was very manual. They were having to manually send out tax receipts, manually liquidate the crypto. They were having a hard time collecting the donor info and getting it into their CRM. Just a lot of manual processes and work for every single gift. And we automated a lot of that for them. So even though they had been doing it for so long, when we came around, we signed up Save the Children in, I think it was probably 2019. Um, We've been working with them ever since. And they're raising millions of dollars a year in crypto donations. And the amount they've raised has gone up dramatically since they switched to using us. Because not only are we helping them actually you know, automate this and save their team time. We're actually helping them understand like, who are these donors? How do you find them? Right? Like, how do you talk the talk? We always joke that, you know, we want to keep our clients from writing Bitcoin as two words because they might scare away the donors <laughs> if they don't know what they, they look like. They don't know what they're talking about. So as you can imagine, they, they find that kind of coaching and, and training really helpful. So I, I know a lot of people think that typical crypto donors are all about tech and innovation and stock donors might just be investors or kind of big wig executives. But that's not always the case, right? So who are typical crypto donors? So, I mean, like we were saying in the beginning, right, like 90 percent of wealth is held in non-cash and the proportion of Americans and, and people globally that own crypto is going up dramatically. Hundreds and hundreds of millions. I think the last number I saw was 400 million people now on crypto globally. People are usually shocked by this, right? Because they think I it's am. this niche thing. Yeah, I'm it's shocked. Huge, right? This is a huge, we always say this is a donor demographic more than it's a donation method because it's so massive. It's more than the population of the United States. So this started as something, right? That was kind of a, a tech savvy person that, you know, maybe you worked at a startup in Silicon Valley that you got into, but it's becoming much, much more mainstream now. And although maybe the average person might be a bit more tech savvy that owns crypto, it's it's really everyone. And it skews a bit younger still, but that's still changing over time because these platforms like Fidelity, where you're used to buying stocks, now offer crypto trading too. So it's really becoming part of the more mainstream financial services systems where soon, I mean, I'm a little biased, but I think there'll be more people that own crypto that don't own crypto. What about conversely? Who are your typical stock donors? So interestingly, a lot of overlap, or maybe not that surprising, right? Um, I think in general, when people, especially younger people, millennials, Gen Z, start investing, they're often investing in stocks and crypto, not necessarily just one. So often the, the same people own both assets. I would say the bigger difference is probably crypto skews a bit younger than stocks do. Um, but often we're finding a lot of overlap in those donors. And you know, I would say the bigger difference with with stocks is, I think accepting stocks is is more comfortable or more commonplace for nonprofits than crypto is, right? Stocks have been around a, quite a bit longer. 
But what was surprising to us was how difficult it was for nonprofits to accept stocks because they've been around for so long. It's it's very antiquated in some regards, right? You'll often come across a nonprofit's page that'll say, hey, we take stock. Here's our JP Morgan brokerage info. Have fun, right? <laughs> they do. Uh, they all, almost almost every nonprofit has that on their website. Yeah. Yeah. And and most donors, they don't really want to deal with that, right? They don't want to call someone to make their gift. They don't want to in some cases we saw you have to fax something. We're like, mm-hmm. I don't think most of the donors have a fax machine anymore. You know, this overlap of donors can be really, really powerful. Mm-hmm. And I think the biggest thing nonprofits need to realize is where the donors are and where their wealth is too. You can ask them for cash gifts as much as you want, but if they don't have cash to give, they they simply can't give it, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You mentioned that it might be a, a good approach to look at crypto donors and stock donors as donor demographics, not as a way of giving, not as a, a transaction. So what is a good way to solicit non-cash contributions as part of a bigger fundraising strategy? Do you do it the same way as you ask for a check in the mail or someone to go online and make a donation? So we have sort of a hybrid approach to this. It's it's both your existing donors plus trying to attract net new. I think the first part is actually the easier one, right? Opening up these donation methods to your existing audience and your existing donor base who maybe they're giving you $100 a month on their credit card, but could be giving $1,000 a month if they could give crypto or stock. We see the, the average gift size increase dramatically when you start adding these methods because we're seeing you know roughly $10,000 as the average gift size for non-cash gifts. And you know it's really underutilized. So one of the easiest things we say is, before you even think about the net new donors, how do you tell your existing donor base in your community that you now can donate with crypto stock or any other non-cash gifts you accept and then make it as easy as possible, right? And you see those larger gift sizes come in. And it's not that you need to do anything necessarily very different with how you message it and fundraise it. It could be as easy as just in your emails that are already going out or in your direct mail that's already going out, in your social posts saying, hey, by the way, we take crypto now. Hey, by the way, we take stock. Like, hey, make your end of year non-cash gift. It's super easy, right? The the biggest mistake we see is sometimes they add these donation methods, but they don't tell anyone about it, right? And sometimes it's it's so hidden on the website. And one thing I'm really excited about with our partnership on DonorBox is it's now in the primary donation form, right? So everyone coming to make a gift is going to see that as an option. Because in the past, we've seen it hidden in other ways to give. It's often difficult to find, which is really going to limit the exposure of those donors. So that's my long-winded part on the existing donors. <laughs> but I think, that's a, I think that that is a good approach. It would also be a really good approach once you start getting some stock and crypto donors to profile those, to share their story of why they chose to give that way as some social proof that it's it's not intimidating and it's not scary, but it can be just as impactful, if not more, than that credit card donation that that someone might be making monthly. I love that. Yeah, exactly. And then the second piece that I mentioned was these like net new donors, which nonprofits are always coming to us saying, I want to diversify my revenue. I want to connect with with ultimately new donors to get new dollars into the organization. And bonus points if they're younger, right? <laughs> um, we hear that all the time, especially these last couple of years with a lot of the uncertainty going on in the world, whether it was COVID or, or wars or natural disasters. And there certainly are a lot of donors out there who only give in crypto or stock or non-cash gifts in large part because that's where most of their money is, right? So in some cases, we're finding that nonprofits start accepting crypto and stock are getting these net new donors, often younger donors, let's say in their 30s, who most of their net worth is in crypto or in stocks. And that's the only way they're really interested in giving. And sometimes they're finding nonprofits and building these relationships for the first time because they heard they now accept crypto. They now accept stock. And they're like, wow, that's so cool. This is my new favorite nonprofit. And it's really unique, I think, to have this early relationship with a lot of these donors because it's early in their their journey, right? Like this could be their first time making a major gift because you're taking crypto or because you're taking stock. So there's just a ton of upside and growth there for nonprofits. And then it's important for the nonprofit to continue that relationship, to continue communicating and showing impact and gratitude for the gifts that they receive from these donors. Exactly. That's spot on. So Alex, as we think about year-end fundraising for 2023, what do you see that's ahead and what are some ways that these non-cash giving options can really help nonprofits? Similar to most giving in the nonprofit space, a lot of attention is given to the last quarter of the year, especially December. 
And that trend is actually even stronger with non-cash giving. Sometimes we're seeing as much as 50% of donations coming in towards the end of the year in Q4 and especially in December. And we saw this partially being driven by the tax year, right? Because there is this tax benefit of donating crypto. If someone wants it to count for that year's tax return, they need to donate before January 1st. So there's a lot of last minute giving in December. And because of that, we even set up a, like essentially awareness and fundraising days. So in 2019, we launched the first ever crypto giving Tuesday. Oh, Lunar giving Tuesday. That's awesome. Yeah. So we, we kind of rally together the community, you know, corporate gifts, find matches, find influence to help promote it. And we always do it on the same day as Giving Tuesday, which, you know, leaves you kind of a month left in the year to really rally those donors, remind them to get their gifts in. We even had NF Tuesday for the first time this last couple of years. Um, so we always do a big end of year campaign since that's when so many of the gifts are happening. When is an ideal time to start drawing awareness around fundraising with non-cash assets? It really is a year-round thing. Um, this isn't something you can only talk about in December and <laughs> expect to see the results. Right? It takes a couple mentions, a couple reminders. And I would say that's a very common mistake, right? where we see them just talk about it in December or just in Q4, and then they wait until Q4 next year. And it really makes it difficult to get your name out there and build relationships when you do that. Mm -hmm. um, because some donors might see that and then they might go reach out to their accountant or their financial advisor and say, hey, I'm thinking about donating crypto. I'm thinking about donating stock. It's not necessarily something they're just going to do on the spot the first time they hear about it. It is a bit more strategic, this kind of giving, because the gifts do tend to be larger. So it is important to have that sort of momentum and that drum beat throughout the year. So it's not just a, a sort of a last minute thought right before the end of the year. So if someone wanted to learn more about accepting non-cash assets for their organization, I imagine it still is quite intimidating to know what you don't know. So where would they go to learn? I'd recommend going to thegivingblock.com. Mm -hmm. We have a newsletter. We have a blog where we share resources about, you know, kind of the 101 basics. We hold webinars. And I would say this, this goes back to what I mentioned earlier of like, don't worry about understanding how, right, like Bitcoin mining works right? <laughs> uh, focus more on the benefits and the, the why and the how of accepting non-cash gifts rather than the, the complex technicalities. Because um, I think that's what, what you know, is a little scary to people, right? When they're adding these new donation methods. Stick to, to the fundraising aspect of it rather than the technology aspect because awesome partners like DonorBox are making the technical piece easy with this partnership. So, you know, you don't have to worry about that part. Just start reading, start learning, subscribe to the newsletter, look at other nonprofits who have started doing this and seen the huge potential, plenty of case studies and testimonials on the website too. So poke around the website a bit. And when you're ready, you know, you can set up a demo with someone on our team. They can run you through how it all works and then show you how easy it is. It's a remedy for those who have that learning curve that they want to learn more, just going to one spot. I love that they can learn more through a demo and seeing how it works and then reading some of those case studies. That would be very helpful to me. I learned a lot from you, Alex, today. Thank you so much for sharing some of those examples. Thank you for spending time with the Nonprofit Podcast today, Alex. Thanks so much. Accepting non-cash contributions could be a real game changer for your organization. Are you ready to jump in or maybe you still need a little convincing? Either way, join Alex and DonorBox experts Jenna and Zark at 2 p.m. Eastern on Thursday, September 7th for a special webinar. It's called Crypto and Stock Giving 101. I hope you'll join us for this session so you can get some visuals around some of the things we discussed today. Plus, you'll have a time to get your questions answered. I put a link for you in the show notes so you can go ahead and register today. And I'll be watching right alongside you. So I hope to see you there. And hey, I want to say thank you for spending a little of your time with the Nonprofit Podcast. I hope you've left with the confidence to take a small step today that will make a big difference tomorrow. Be sure to click the download button on your podcast player, then leave the Nonprofit Podcast a review or give it a thumbs up if you're listening to the Nonprofit Podcast on YouTube. Your review really is a great way to help others find us. You're here to help others. We're here to help you. So until next time, stay inspired. That warm feeling when you help someone, it's not just happiness, it's fulfillment. And we believe it should be available to everyone. From frontline heroes to first-time fundraisers, our tools empower you to help others. This is our mission. This is DonorBox, helping you help others.